All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining me today. My name is Brandon Satram, and I am the VP of Developer Experience Engineering at Blues, a wireless IoT product company. And to get things started today, I want to talk about one of my favorite IoT topics, and that is purgatory. Specifically, the prototype or proof of concept purgatory that we often find ourselves in as builders, as developers. Now, we all know that hardware is hard, that firmware is difficult, but that in and of itself doesn't really explain why 75% 70 of IoT products take twice as long as estimated, and many end up being canceled even before that pre-launch stage, before a company sees any value from that effort. And often, it seems like the reason why this happens is because of the time it takes us to get a POC off the ground, to go from that point of idea to something working and running in the field, even before we consider a 1,000 or a 100,000 or a million units, right? It's often that first, second, or third device that we have issues with that slow us down. So consider an example. So let's say you're looking to build a device to monitor outdoor, outdoor conditions on a farm. So for your POC, you want to start with a garden. So you buy the hardware you, uh, you need and you grab your favorite MCU or single board computer, uh, but this project is going to be outside and away from Wi-Fi, so you're also going to need a cellular modem. And you grab one from Quicktel or Ublox or you get a Nordic 9160 dev kit. And you've got the pieces, that's great. You've assembled this bag of parts, as it were. Uh, but now you need to figure out how to program the modem using whatever flavor of AT commands the modem vendor uses. Uh, you're going to need to source a SIM and a data plan from somebody. Then you need to figure out where to send that data, how to communicate remotely with your product, oh, and if needed, where to store certs, how to encrypt your data, and then figure out transport. Oh, and uh, you also, if you want to do firmware updates, you're going to have to figure out how to do a DFU back to the device. And there's a lot. So alternatively, rather than doing all those things yourself, you could sign up for an IoT platform where all of those decisions are made for you. And what you tend to give up is flexibility and control uh, for that for that trade. You're right, you take the MCU, the language, data limits, pricing model, whatever you get, and you don't have a fit. You follow the guardrails set out for you. And in either case, what we engineers have to deal with in this space almost more than anything else is complexity. Um, it's a word that I say a lot, that we hear a lot. The reality is that it's hard to do the work that we do. And any time that I think about complexity, I think about a quote from my boss and our CEO at Blues, Ray Ozzy. And that quote is, complexity kills. It sucks the life out of developers. It makes products hard to plan, build, and test. I'm guessing all of us in, the, in this room feel the truth in that statement because we've lived it. We've experienced it in one form or another. The funny thing about this quote is that this is something that Ray said long before founding Blues, and really, when he said it, he was referring to the software space. He hadn't yet seen the pain that those of us that have worked in hardware for a while have had to deal with, and it is doubly true for us. We are awash in complexity in the IoT space. And over the years, we've tried to come up with ways to manage this, right? We've tried to figure out ways to, 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 to deal with that. Some, some, you know, one of the ways that we've done that in the past is by having IoT platforms, by setting up guardrails that, uh, that we use to navigate to make things easier, right? Another is that we try to standardize processes. We try to figure out, we all come together and try to agree on the way that we're going to do things in the hardware and the firmware space. And there are some good examples of this. In the early days of Arduino's rise, there were a small number of pin layouts, which made it easy for other vendors to create shields that can plug in easily into a compatible Arduino to add additional capabilities. We're all familiar with this. Part of what led to the growth of the Arduino ecosystem's rise was that for many years, this pin layout, this shield ecosystem, was relatively consistent. But I would argue that the Raspberry Pi is an even better example because with that 40-pin double-wide header, the Pi created inadvertently an add-on ecosystem that was so popular that that same header can be found on almost every competing single-board computer out there today. And then there are some examples where we made a solid attempt, but the results were mixed. And we can look at peripheral connectors here as an example. Uh, in 2013, Seed Studio introduced the Humble Grove connector, a four-pin JST that could be used to connect serial, I2C, and even in some cases, GPIOs, with a huge number of Grove-compatible peripherals. There are hundreds of, the th of these things that you can buy that do almost everything that you can imagine. 
the problem is that that, you know, as our boards and our products get smaller, that, that, that Grove JST looks pretty big. So other vendors like SparkFun and Adafruit introduced their own variant using a smaller JST. SparkFun calls theirs Quick, and Adafruit calls theirs Stemma QT. Two different names, same connector. So are they compatible? Kind of. For most applications, you can use breakouts from SparkFun and Adafruit interchangeably. Uh, but there actually are a few edge cases, especially around whether the peripheral has a logic level shifter built into the actual peripheral itself and a regulator so that it can be used with both 3-volt and 5-volt logic. So you could potentially buy one of these boards, plug it into a different connector, and you've burned out your project. And you'll figure it out when the magic smoke appears or not. Another example of where we've gotten mixed results to date is in the world of firmware updates. So specifically, firmware updates perform remotely or over the air. We spent a lot of time trying to solve this problem in SDKs and platforms, but has anybody really solved this problem in a way that doesn't force us as developers to either give up control or have to embrace dealing with the complexity ourselves? And that's what I want to talk about today. A little bit about the current state of OTA DFU and the two most predominant approaches that we have today. And then I want to introduce a new third way, something that we at Blues are calling Outboard DFU, and I'll do a couple of demos along the way. First, let's just kind of take a look at the current state of OTA DFU. Uh, now, when I say DFU, I, I never assume that acronyms and the TLAs that we throw around are known by everybody. So DFU stands for Device Firmware Update. This is, simply put, just the process of getting a new piece of firmware on a device by laying down a binary with an updated program in some known memory address. That is physically it. Uh, and in all cases, DFU relies the existence of some sort of bootloader to be programmed. The bootloader can be a small piece of code that's stored in non-volatile memory, or it can be a soft bootloader. But the bootloader exists to do two things. One is to launch the main application on the device, and the second is to provide the capability of updating that device's firmware if a new binary is available. Now, for the latter capability, devices require there's a, the bootloader itself has to be entered, right? You have to actually place the device into its bootloader mode. Uh, so, for example, if you've ever flashed your firmware to an STM32 device using the Arduino IDE and a USB connection or platform I own a USB connection and not a programmer, you've actually done this by placing ST devices into its bootloader by manually pressing the boot and reset buttons and hope that you get them in the right order and that it actually does enter the bootloader properly. Um, alternatively, if you've used an ST-Link or a J-Link or another programmer, uh, you've gotten to skip that process because those programmers have a hard connection to putting the device into its own bootloader for you. So that's the DFU process. That's DFU. OTA is the piece of the puzzle that stands for over the air, and it means the process of delivering new firmware to a target device over a wireless connection. So not using a programmer, like I just talked about, or not using a USB connection. Now often, in, this, in the early days of OTA, OTA DFU, we talked about Bluetooth. Bluetooth was one of the early ways. Uh, we talked a lot about doing this with either Nordic or Scilab devices using their mobile apps. Uh, that has tended to be sort of the early way of doing OTA, but it doesn't have to be Bluetooth to, to do OTA DFU. Shipping a binary over cellular or Wi-Fi is also, is also over the air. Now, in a world where nearly all solutions are cloud connected, OTA DFU is it's a table stakes feature, right? None of us would build a product in the field these days and put it in the field without providing some remote way of updating updating that capability, updating that firmware. I would hope we would at this point. Right? We've seen enough botnets in the wild to realize that we should probably have the ability to patch our devices if there is a security issue. Um, and, but even in today, this, it's still complex, right? There are really only two approaches available to us when we actually want to reach into a deployed device and do something to it to update its firmware. The first approach is something that, that I like to call OS DFU, or Operating System DFU, in which a vendor solves that DFU problem end-to-end -end with their own kernel and their cloud service. So the vendor in this case, and it's going to be an IoT platform, solves all of the complexity of DFU for you, and they provide a cloud console for updating, uploading firmware, and they facilitate that firmware delivery process to devices, to one device, or a fleet of devices all at once. 
Now, on the device side, because there's two pieces to this, right? There's the cloud piece, and then there's the actual physical device piece. On the device side, the vendor provides firmware that will actually manage that process as a part of their kernel, or RTOS. And that manages every piece of retrieving firmware from the cloud service, placing the device into its bootloader, and then updating the application, or RTOS firmware, on the device, restarting the device so that it can enter its new operating mode. The advantage of this approach is that it's completely hands-off for the developer. If you opt into one of these platforms, you get this ability to perform DFU for free. It is included for you. The platform takes care of everything from delivery to on-device updates. Now, the disadvantage of this approach is the lack of control on the part of us developers, right? In order for the vendor to make this experience hands-off, they have to place very high guardrails in place and dictate a narrow set of supported hardware, programming languages, and even IDE, right? You don't get that choice of bringing your own microcontroller, bringing your own cloud service in this sort of an environment. To get the benefit of OSDFU, you have to yield some of your freedom as a developer to the vendor. Now, the easiest way to know whether or not a vendor uses an OSD, OSDFU approach is to look at their hardware support for host MCUs. So do you have to use the hardware that they sell in order to, and, and that they manage in order to use their firmware as, a, as, ex, excuse me, as opposed to an off-the-shelf kit or a chip based on your skill set or preference? That is going to be OSDFU. Now, on the other side is cooperative DFU. And in this approach, both the vendor and the developer have to complete some piece of the puzzle. They have to cooperate in order to perform the update process. And usually, the way that this works is the vendor hosts that firmware binary for you in a cloud service. It provides that binary for secure delivery to a host. And then the developer, we then have to write the actual code to update that host and put the new binary, lay the new binary down alongside the running application in real time and restart the device. Now, <clears throat> and this, is a, this is an approach that differs a lot depending on what form of wireless protocol you're using. For example, if Bluetooth is your update mechanism, the server that actually hosts the binary is a Bluetooth-capable device like a phone. You download it. That must be brought within a few meters of the host in order to initiate an update. And on the target, the process varies from one MCU vendor to the next and wireless communication protocol. But the, you know, every, every product will follow a similar approach, which is getting some sort of notification on the embedded device that firmware is available, receiving that firmware from the server one chunk at a time, and placing that firmware in a temporary location in Flash, validating each chunk or the entire binary after it's all been streamed in, copying that complete firmware to an appropriate location, restarting it, and now we're off and running again. And if you're not using Bluetooth for OTA DFU, you're likely using something like cellular or Wi-Fi. And the server in this case is very similar. It's a remote cloud service that hosts and delivers the binary. But beyond that, on the host side, on the actual device side, the process is exactly the same, whether it's Bluetooth or whether it's Wi-Fi or cellular. <clears throat> now, this is all important because in the case of my company, Blues, OTA DFU consists of two key components. I'm going to demo these for you in just a moment before we talk about the third form of uh, OTA DFU, a firmware update. Uh, but it starts with a note card. So the note card is a hardware product that we provide to customers. It is a device to cloud data pump that comes in a 30 by 35 millimeter package with an M.2 connector, and it can be incorporated into any design or field replaced. It comes in Wi-Fi and cellular variants that are project swappable. And the cellular variant includes 500 megs of data and 10 years of secure cellular connectivity included in the cost of the device. So you're not paying for a monthly data plan in order to opt into cellular. Now, as a data pump, the note card is meant to be used with the MCU and host of your choice. You can, spick, you can pick an STM32, ESP32, or even an 8-bit Arduino, right? Any embedded device that can print and read strings can talk to the note card. And the note card speaks 100% JSON, so you're not writing AT commands against a cellular modem uh, and dealing with their specific variant. It communicates over serial or I squared C. And you can also use any embedded language that can, print, can read and print strings, right? Whether it's C, C++, Arduino, Tiny. Go, Rust, and CircuitPython. Um, 
Now, on the cloud side, which is where the OTA DFU piece comes in, that's all facilitated with a very thin piece of middleware that we call NodeHub.io. NodeHub exists to basically provide a couple of capabilities that are relevant. One is the data routing side. is specifically just there to help our customers route data to where that data actually needs to go. We are not a platform. And so when you're taking data from a temperature and humidity sensor and you need to get it to AWS, we solve that messy middle piece of getting those devices talking together. But we also provide the firmware update capability, which is something that I will talk about here in just a moment. Um, what we do effectively is the note card can provide secure firmware updates not only for its own firmware. There's an STM32L4R5, a low power chip on the actual product itself, but can provide the binaries to whatever embedded program that you're actually working with. So let me show you uh, a demo of this right now. And as I do that, what I'm going to be demoing today in a couple of different variants with a couple of different MCUs is this is the Wi-Fi version of the note card that is actually sitting on a development board, a development kit that we call note carriers. And so because the product is on an M.2 connector, we recognize people aren't going to spin a board just to try something out for one. So we have a couple of different variants of these note cards, one that has a Feather compatible slot on it, so any Feather microcontroller you can slot in there and work with. And the one that I've got on here right now is the good old ESP. P32, um, the early, the Adafruit ESP32 Huzzah specifically, and that is plugged into the ESP32, and I've also got it plugged in over serial, and so let me switch back here. And I have pulled up, uh, blues.dev is our developer docs, our, our tutorials, but it's also the place where we host something called the uh, in-browser terminal. So one of the nice things about modern browsers is that if you're connected to uh, microcontrollers over USB serial, you can, with certain tools and utilities, have the ability to actually talk to those devices over the browser without installing a custom tool chain, and that's really nice. And so in our case, I have a USB connection to the note card, so I can actually send commands to the note card. Before I demo the ESP32 side of this, I did want to show you briefly when I talk about the note card speaking JSON, exactly what that looks like. And so uh, every, every request made to the note card looks exactly like a valid JSON object. And there is a set of complete docs that show you exactly how to communicate with a device, but what I can do is I can actually find out what is its connection, what project on NodeHub am I connected to using hub.get. I can also do a hub.set to actually change the product that I'm connected to. Uh, but when it comes to actually sending data, I can do something called a note.add. And the way that this works is I can send any arbitrary JSON to the note card itself, and that ends up in the cloud service and ultimately on the other end in your ultimate cloud service. And so all I need to do in order to do this is pass in a valid JSON body. I'll do a very simple one. Canonical developer example, foo bar. I'll add that three or four times, and you'll notice here that I'm queuing notes to the note card when the next sync actually happens. I can see in the status message at the top that uh, I did my last sync 23 minutes ago. Not quite time for me to do it yet because I haven't actually initiated a sync. But what I can do is also query the note card to find out, okay, what do you actually have loaded on you? And so if I do file.changes, if I'm looking for it in the up my call here, file.stats, excuse me, um, I can see that they are not there. I must have already done the sync. Ah, it did the sync before I could do it. Here, I'll go to it again. And I'll do file.stats, and I'll see now I've got these two files that are actually sitting here waiting. Uh, the note card operates in a store and forward model. You can be continuously connected, but if you're building an application that doesn't always need to be connected, uh, then you can queue up events, queue up notes, and then send those later on down the line. Now, on the, on the actual cloud side, if I go into my project here at notehub.io, uh, I can see that my device is connected, that I just sent in a couple of events, and then I can route those out into any uh, location that I might prefer on down the line. But let's get back to the actual firmware piece. I shared that with you briefly because I wanted you to be able to sort of orient what this looks like when I go into the ESP32 specific example. And so I have here uh, in, in uh, VS Code a very, very simple ESP32 application. It is an Arduino application. 
Uh, and all it's doing basically is waiting for button presses and then sending notes. But you'll see that in my in this Arduino application, I'm sending in JSON strings just like I did in the in-browser terminal. I'm configuring my connection to the device. I'm checking whether or not there's a DFU that is available using the DFU status API. Uh, and then I am basically waiting for button presses to either perform a sensor me measurement uh, or to check for new firmware. And then I'm doing the note.add to send data into the cloud service. But that's not really the relevant piece for this demo. The important piece is that I am also, because this is an ESP, this is an ESP32 that's using the cooperative DFU approach, I'm responsible for performing that firmware update. So in order to do that, I have a second, uh, I have a second file here that is actually using the ESP IDF's partition system to pull down firmware updates from the note card and then put those on the device one at a time. And so I'm not going to belabor this code because this session is not about how to perform ESP32 firmware updates using ESP IDF. You're welcome to check that out if you want. But the real point of this demo is to show you everything that I have to do. I basically have to CRC check every chunk that comes along. I have to pull to see whether or not a DFU is ready from the note card. If, the DF, if a DFU is ready for the note, from the note card, I then go and get one chunk at a time in, in uh, 8K increments. I validate the CRC on each one of those increments. And then I basically create boot and, ru boot and running partitions on the ESP32 itself, stream in that new binary once I've got it, and then reset the device, right? And I'm getting 8K chunks over and over again as those are coming down to the device. What this all comes down to is that in order for this to work in ESP32, I've had to add 311 lines of code that do nothing but facilitate the firmware update capability. And that's going to be important in just a second. But once I built that, once I've actually written this application, I built the binary, the way that the note card piece of this works is that I can go into the Note Hub UI, into my project, and I have the ability to pull up firmware binaries. And so you'll see here that I have this ESP32 co-op DFU. I have another binary here. It is a 282, the ESP IDF is huge, a 282K binary that I'm going to ship down uh, over, the note, uh, over the note card that will then be delivered to my device. And so the way that I perform that update is I will select my device. I'll choose host firmware here. You'll notice that I'm running version 1.0.0. I want to update it to 1.1.0. Uh, I'm going to come here in the menu. I'm going to select the update option. I'm going to choose this 110 version. I will click apply. And at this point, the note card, the, the note hub now will tell the note card the next time it syncs that a new binary is ready. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a uh, special hyper programmer mode that prints everything that comes across the terminal. So you're going to see a lot of stuff stream across. What I'm going to do is I'm going to manually perform a sync <coughs> And as that sync happens, the note card will then be informed that a new binary is available, and it will start downloading that binary. Now, it doesn't halt the running of my actual application. It's just delivering the binary on behalf of the device. And you can see, I saw one very quickly. You can see one come across, right? So it's getting that binary one chunk at a time. What, that, what it does, basically, is it places that binary. Once it's reassembled, it places it into the flash on the note card. There's room on the note card for about a meg in terms of the binary that you can pull down to then put on the device. It's grabbing that one bit at a time. You'll see here as the DFU user, the migration messages come across. It's going to reassemble that, and then it's going to let my host know that a binary is available. Now, if I refresh the browser here, I can see, well, it hasn't done a sync again. Let me do another sync here. It restarted. Oh, it's trying to do that. It's trying to do a, a different, hold on. So I'm seeing ready to install firmware. Now, I'm not going to show you the, the device and the DFU process yet on this demo because I want to save it for the next one. But what I did, the reason why I wanted to share this is because what has to happen then when that binary is delivered is that my host, my actual uh, ESP32 application, then has to go in and do the rest of the heavy lifting. And I have that 300 lines of code that go and do that for me. So. 
one of the most important things to really think about when it comes to cooperative DFU is that my actual application code it was only a couple hundred lines. There really wasn't that much to it. It was a very small part of all the code that I had to add in order for this process to work. Even with a library or a helper class uh, that facilitates the transfer process, the app itself has to know a lot about how to update itself in order for that process to be useful. And so, in general, the strength of cooperative DFU is that the developer has complete control. You can use any host you want. You can use any cloud infrastructure. This is completely within your control. Um, and there are really no and there's no guardrails beyond whatever those guardrails are imp um, imposed by the, the silicon that you use, right? Whatever their bootloader process might be. Uh, so the drawback, however, and you saw this, is that you're because you're responsible for handling the update, you have this manual and time-consuming process of having to write the firmware update code as a part of building your application. But if a change is introduced that bricks that bricks your device, the update mechanism is running in your app code. You brick the app, now you can't update it. You have a device that cannot physically be updated in the field, which means that the benefit of OTA DFU is lost when you introduce a bug that causes the device to no longer be functional. So with the two approaches that I shared, it might be possible to think, OK, well, we have two choices. We either give up control to get hands off DFU, or we keep control and add a lot of time consuming work, right? We can either uh, have control and choose the parts and products we want to work with, or we can get a hands off DFU approach. And I really want to, I want to introduce the third way, because we believe that you can actually get hands off, D hands off DFU without sacrificing that choice, and that's through something that we at Blues call outboard DFU. Now, I use the word outboard here like an outboard motor on a boat. And it's a boat that is attached to, but not an integrated part of the boat itself. It's effectively lashed to the craft, and it can control it and propel it when placed in the water, but it can also be removed or replaced without damaging the boat itself. It is, not, it is an integral part of the system, but it's still a boat if you remove the motor. It's just a boat that doesn't move. We're going to move through other, other me mechanisms, right? Now, Outboard DFU is a capability that, that we released earlier this year uh, as a part of our product set, and it provides the benefit of being able to use the Note Hub for hosting and delivering binaries like I just showed, but it also allows you to use the note card to be the process, to be the thing that performs that update process. So all of that code in that ESP32 example are gone and are replaced by one piece, one JSON request that I'll show you in a moment that makes that process a lot easier. You're then opting in to a different update approach. And the best part about this is that we can, we can, you can do this, and we also allow you to preserve that choice of MCU family. So there's a lot of ability to continue to use the products that you're used to. And the reason why this is possible today and the note card can perform this is because there's an increasing number of MCUs that have been introduced in the last decade that are shipped with their primary bootloader in ROM and that are unmodifiable by any user operation. So on these devices, which includes all modern ST microelectronics devices and Espressive microcontrollers, when you assert the reset pin, ST microelectronics and Espressive, uh, they, kn they know they load their ROM bootloader. It enters that bootloader and it can load and execute code from a variety of sources, including Flash, RAM, UART, USB I2C, or SPY. The ROM bootloader's behavior is controlled by probing the I.O. ports on the device, checking to make sure that boot and reset are asserted, entering that bootloader, and then streaming in the update, and then resetting the device from that point. And that provides new alternatives for us to actually lay down firmware. So putting it another way, using this approach, you can defer the DFU process to another device, in this case, the note card, and let that handle updating your host, but you preserve the ability to then choose the device that you work with. And the way that this works in our ecosystem is that it's really two steps on the part of the engineer. One is that you make a physical connection between your MCU and the note card via its auxiliary pins. So what this does is it allows the note card to physically assert the boot and reset buttons to place the device into its bootloader. And then it streams that over using the RX and TX pins, using this secondary UART that we have on the device. And then second, Using the note card's JSON API, the essential command, the, the essential thing that you send is card.dfu, the name of the microcontroller that you're working with, STM32, ESP, Nordic, MCU boot, which I'll demo in, in just a little bit. <clears throat> and then you have everything you need to actually then work with this process in the field. Now, 
I recognize that we are talking about this is a hardware change when you're building a product. And so when it comes to giving it a try, this is actually something that's already supported in the hardware that we sell and the products that we work with. Uh, and it also, it works with ST devices, Espressif, and Nordic, the 52840 as well. Uh, this device on the lower left is the, the dev kit that I was using for the last demo that I'll continue using for the next couple of demos. And it works in that uh, Avenue it uses an ST uh, the kit that we provide has an STM32 device called the SWAN uh, that I'll demo in just a moment. It's in a feather compatible form factor. There is also the STM32 F405 that works with this as well. Works with a Nordic NRF 52840. I'll demo that in a moment. Um, as well as the MicroMod ecosystem. So if you're working with uh, SparkFun MicroMod, uh, their new boards actually support this outboard DFU capability as well. So you don't have to use the hardware that we provide. So let's let's actually take a look at a demo of this because this one is a lot more fun. So I'm going to start by actually removing my device here so not messing anything up specifically. I'll delete that very briefly. I'll come back in here and I am going to do a secret factory reset on my device. And I will show you, I'm going to take the power out. I'm going to go to another one of my demos here. And what I'm going to demo here in a moment is basically going from Arduino to a Zephyr RTOS application using outboard DFU. So I can use this approach to swap between RTOSs, to swap between programming languages completely, whatever it, whatever it is I might wish to do. So I'm removing the ESP32. I'm putting the SWAN STM32 microcontroller in here. I'm going to plug it back in. And what you'll see on the device as it powers up is the, the light here is blinking every 250 milliseconds. This is the application that I'm running. My delay is 250 milliseconds. Uh, I have the typical Arduino set up and loop. You'll notice here, I'm, again, I'm doing a hub dot set just like I did in the SP32 demo. That is my connection to tell the note card how to find its project on the cloud service side. And then this is the opt-in thing that I need to do. I want, I'm telling the note card, if you get a binary for me, you have permission to stream it in. You have permission to place my device into the bootloader. This is in an SCM32 family. And that's it. Everything else from that point is just delaying. That's all I had to add to my application. And that's what's running right now. But I have a different version of the application that is in Zephyr. So I have a very similar application that I've written using Zephyr. Uh, we have a Zephyr SDK for the note card that is available to work with. And I am doing a very, very similar thing. If you've done a Zephyr app before, I'm basically just getting a handle to the primary, the primary boot GPIO, the LED, um, checking for button presses. And in my Zephyr application, what I'm doing is basically every time I get a button press, I set a note to the note card, and that goes up to the cloud service. And so again, you'll see a hub dot set, a slightly different serial number here to indicate that the change is made. I'm doing the same opt in here for card.dfu. And then from that point, everything else is just waiting for button presses. And then when I see them, to actually do a note.add and add a note to the note card that then ends up in the cloud service. So I've already built this binary, and I'm doing the exact same thing that I did with the ESP32 side of things. And let me actually reset here, make sure this is doing the right thing. Make sure this is properly configured here before I go on. It is Swan Arduino DFU. Uh, my device should be back online. Here it is. Um, I have another firmware binary that was built specifically for this demo, and this is my Swan Zephyr bin. So I will apply this binary. And same as with the ESP32, as soon as I sync again, the note card will be notified that a device that, that a new binary is available, and it will start downloading that, streaming it down. Um, let me try. Try that again. Here we go. So it is going to, once when the note hub notifies the note card that the binary is available, it will start pulling it down. Um, I'm looking for the magic incantation here. And on the note hub side, as with before, I should see, I should see a notification. There it is. There's my song. My, it's going to go fast. 
There's my swan, Zephyr bin. So the download has started. Um, it looks like it's actually going through the process of doing the update right now. So you'll see what's happening here is I'm, my application code isn't doing anything. The note card is actually writing Flash to perform that DFU update for me. It's going to happen relatively quickly. And as soon as everything is verified, it'll reset the device and it will come back online. And what I'll actually start seeing is new behavior from a new device. So notice that serial number I shared earlier that said Swan Zephyr Outboard DFU. Um, you'll notice that the device will, when I refresh, it'll show up, yep, that the DFU has completed. Now when I press the button on the device, I'll actually be able to see notes that pop in from the note card. Where do we go? Well, maybe. Where's the user button on there? There we go. Um, there's a note from the note card when I hit the button. And I'll sync again. And if I go into my events list, I can see, there we go. The OS has changed, and I'm getting new behavior from a device. And I didn't have to physically program that in order to make that happen. I was able to use the outboard DFU process in order for that to work. And that ability to move between languages is really quite powerful, because it's actually something that we've seen as a real need in the IoT world, where for the sake of speed, and we have customers that do this, we often want to ship a POC written in Arduino or CircuitPython quickly, even if we intend to, mi to migrate to something like Zephyr RTOS or Free RTOS in the future. And speaking of CircuitPython, this is an interesting one. Actually, one of our customers expire, inspired the genesis of what this feature became because they were working with CircuitPython. The problem is, even though CircuitPython is awesome, a binary with a CircuitPython virtual file system and runtime is 500k. Um, and I don't really think any one of us want to wait for that or burn up a cellular data plan or even worse by pushing half meg binaries down to our devices. And so uh, we actually provide a couple of different capabilities for working with this, which is something that could be used in generic applications as well. Because one of the cool things about CircuitPython is that it actually exists in three pieces. And each of those is pegged to a known memory address. One is the CircuitPython UF2 bootloader, which is at address 800. The CircuitPython runtime, which is at address 801. And then your app, which is, which is basically just the CircuitPython scripts and libraries, which is at address eight. Uh, which is at address 810. And what that means is that you can build a binary that targets those addresses and update just your app piece and save a lot of transport time and data. And this works through two utilities that we've created at Blues. One is the open source CircuitPython file system builder. This packages up your Pi file and libraries directory into a binary format. So you basically take that, if you've ever done anything with Circuit, uh, CircuitPython before, your code.py, your lib directory, it takes just those two things, and it puts those in a binary format for you. And then with that bin, you can tell the note card, OK, great, turn this into a bin pack format. And bin pack is a format that we sort of effectively invented. But all it does is wrap the binary in a small header that you can see at the bottom that tells the note card exactly what it's getting and what memory address this needs to go to. Because the value here is what I'm basically telling the, the note card is, Take this binary that I give you, and when you see this with Outboard DFU, lay that down at address OX810. And we know that that's actually the scripts and libraries portion of CircuitPython, but you can actually use that library to update any arbitrary at memory address for your application. So if you're building a C application, or you're building a free RTOS-based or Zephyr RTOS-based application, and you want an update just a piece, think about an ML model, for instance. You want to update just that model file, and you, have the, you know the address, the memory address that that's in. Uh, BinPack is the way that you can do that and actually get that into to the note card itself. Um, in addition, we have the ability, let me actually let me demo that really quickly. And I have a, another device in my bag that I failed to pull out. So let me grab it really quick, because I can actually show CircuitPython in action before we go to the last piece here. And I have the same SWAN, the same STM32 microcontrollers before, but it has actually been preloaded with a 
uh, circuit Python application that does something similar to the other demo that I just showed. It blinks an LED. It's such a wonderful multi-purpose, right? We all build real world apps that do nothing but blink LEDs, right? Or is that just me? Um, and so I am now going to show you, now that this is plugged in, I can open up uh, a circuit Python IDE like Thani. It's always good fun. And let's see, I will open this. Where is my, how oh, did it not show up? Hold on. I might cut bait on this demo really quick if it proves not to work. Okay, it's not registering the drive. That's all right. Um, with CircuitPython on the NodeHub side, I have a version of that same, the same demo. And you'll notice I mentioned a 500K binary for CircuitPython. If I take just code.py and files, I get something more like 78K. I get a quite a bit smaller application that I can put down on the device itself, and I can get even smaller than that. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about very briefly uh, before I take questions in the last few moments that we have is to talk about MCU boot, right? Because we've already looked at how Albert DFU can be used with ROM-based bootloaders. Uh, like what I showed with ST devices, the reason that, that works is because STM32 microcontrollers all have a ROM-based bootloader that you're able to work with. And so the note card places that device into its bootloader, streams in, binary, and then resets, right? But it's very common for devices nowadays to have soft bootloaders. The Nordic devices have a soft bootloader. Um, and one of the things that has been really neat as we've seen this develop in the ecosystem is that uh, we have support for Nordic devices using MCU boot. Now, uh, MCU boot is an open source standard, and the idea, if you're not familiar with it, is to provide a standard and library that defines effectively a common infrastructure for a device's bootloader. So you can effectively put a bootloader on any device, and that system flash knows its layout, it knows where the bootloader exists, it knows where the application in exists. If there needs to be some sort of swap or scratch location, it knows where that resides in memory as well. And so you have a cross-platform way of defining or sort of structuring a bootloader on a known device, and then that can work with a bootloader-capable ODFU uh, system. And so uh, MCU boot has great support in Zephyr. Uh, it works in Apache Minute, NutX, the Riot, um, Riot, RTOS, Embed, but it also works with a lot of Espressive and Cypress and Infineon devices. So there's a lot of broad support for, outboard, uh, for MCU boot. And what this ends up looking like, I'm not going to demo it live, uh, but what this ends up looking like, I have another Zephyr application. And it is, again, very similar to the other Zephyr application I showed before. It's basically just looking for a button press and sending notes to the note card. But the difference here is that I have this child image directory. I've done a couple of things. In my project conf, um, I have I've done a config. I've basically added a configuration to say I have a bootloader. I'm using MCU boot. Zephyr sees that. It knows what else to look for from this point. It goes and finds a child image directory called MCU boot, and it pulls in the overlay for that. So it actually knows what I'm doing in the overlay with Zephyr is basically saying what's my LED and what's the button to enter. Or sorry, what's the LED for status and what's the button I use for actually entering the bootloader or the GPIO for entering the, the bootloader. And so then Zephyr can actually take care of the rest of seeing that bootloader mode has been entered and putting that device into that mode. And then the only difference from the note card standpoint, when I tell the note card I'm going to do card.dfu, uh, is it basically is instead of sending in that STM32 string, I send in a uh, MCU boot string. And then that works with any compatible device at this point. So definitely something worth checking out. Uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, you can learn more about Outboard DFU at blues.dev. Uh, try it out for yourself. Um, here to answer any questions in the next few moments that we have. We also have a booth upstairs on three, right at the top of the escalators, the top of the stairs over here. Am I even pointing in the right direction? Maybe, who knows? Wander, and you'll find us uh, in a booth somewhere. Uh, please do come and visit. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate it. Any questions before we are done? Going once, going twice. Oh, one question, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, are you connecting the note card directly to the STM device? Yes, yeah.
Great. Okay. So the question is, yeah, wh where's where's the over the air part? So just to be specific about it, the connection between the host and the note card is actually on the PCB itself. Effectively, if you're building a product for this, you have a physical wired connection between the note card and the STM32. The over the air part is what gets the gets the firmware onto the note card itself. The the DFU part, the note card then handles with. Then, then facilitates on the host, right, with the host itself. It places the host into its bootloader, and it streams the binary in one chunk at a time onto the device itself with DFU. Yes. I'm sorry, what was the question? I'm not sure I follow the question. We should, just, we should talk afterwards. I'm not sure I'm following the, the line of questioning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the question is, do we verify the image after it was written to the device? So we verify, we do a CRC check on every chunk as it comes down to the device, 8K at a time. And then the note card will verify the entire image. And if you're using MCU boot, you have the additional verification and the signing check that MCU boot facilitates. Yeah, the question is, uh, with the first update, oh yeah, the first update mechanism that was using the cooperative DFU, are you downloading the whole package before verifying the metadata? And the answer is yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, I am out of time, I just got the stop sign. Thank you all.